I'd like to introduce Rob Bevan, who's going to talk about how biorefineries and green products will make their mark. Excellent. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Bevan. I'm an innovation manager with uh, with Pira. Uh, part of my job is to help companies to develop uh, new products, processes, and services. What I'm going to talk about today is biorefining. Um, give you a very brief introduction to what biorefining is. Uh, a bit about the the trend in the biorefining market. Talk a bit more about the challenges and opportunities that it offers, and then finish with some of the activities that Peer is undertaking in this area. As uh, Andy Dean mentioned earlier, these are the, the publicly funded uh, projects that we're involved in. So what are biorefineries? Essentially, they are facilities that convert biomass into bio-based energy, fuels, materials, and chemicals. So when we talk about biomass, this can be anything from agricultural crops, such as sugarcane or corn or maize or rape, um, through to dedicated energy crops, such as grasses and, um, and various types of soft and hardwood, through to industrial wastes, which might be of more interest to yourselves. So these could be things like brewer spent grain, could be potato peels, uh, it could be, for example, sludge from your um, wastewater treatment processes. Um, so the objective of biorefining is to convert these biomasses into bio-based products. And we do this through a range of different conversion technologies. Uh, some examples are here is we have um, thermal processes. And here these are using uh, essentially pyrolysis or gasification type processes to decompose the biomass into, say, an oil or a gas. And we can then use more conventional type chemistry known within the petrochemical industry to convert this to, to various different types of products. Alternatively, we can use combinations of chemical or biological type processes uh, to break down the biomass into its bio components, so its platform components, and then to convert these to more bio-derived type products. Um, one of the advantages of the bio-based transformations, such as enzyme catalysis or fermentation, are they offer a lot of specificity or the ability to undertake multiple transformations within one process. But they do have a number of limitations in terms of their cost, in terms of their sensitivity to the processing environment, so we do need to be a little careful when, um, when considering which technologies to combine. And in terms of the product streams that biorefineries can give us, um, well this can be pretty much anything that's produced um, within the existing petrochemical type processes, or we can derive, as I said, these bio-derived type products. So these are products which capitalize on the inherent nature of the, the feedstocks within which we're working with. So by way of, of uh, an example, <coughs> brewer's spent grain is a major industrial waste stream. Now we could, if we wanted to, thermally decompose the brewer's spent grain to an oil or a syngas, and as I said, we can use classical chemistry to, to then convert these to uh, a range of different products. You know, for example, paints, we could convert it to polymers, fabrics, uh, mirroring what's done by the petrochemical industry. Alternatively, we could break it down using a combination of chemical <coughs> and biological processes. So it's platform chemicals, such as sugars, and we can then use processes such as fermentation to convert it to bio-based products. So this might be, for example, polylactic acid, or it might be bioethanol. So that's a very, very brief introduction to biorefineries, but why are they so important? What is it that's driving this area of the industry? Well, first of all, we know with the developing nations, there's a growing demand for resources. And we also know there's a finite availability of fossil fuel derived res uh, resources. So this is going to lead to concerns in terms of price and in terms of availability. There's also an overdependence of many countries on imported resources. I'm sure you've heard a lot in the news about um, gas prices and gas, gas pipelines and, and uh, oil. Um, so many nations are starting to look towards, OK, well, how else can we derive our resources other than having to import, say, oil from the Middle East? There's also the reality of climate change. This is something that's affecting uh, all different industry sectors. And there's a trend for wanting to produce things in a sustainable and ecological way. With the global economy, we need to be more competitive. So we need to find ways of diversifying our products and becoming competitive. 
by refining offers the opportunity for us to do something different and to capitalise on a new type of feedstock that will inevitably lead to new types of products. We also have a need to stimulate growth within rural economies. At the moment, uh, we have the Common Agricultural Pro Policy, which provides a lot of subsidies to farmers to produce fuel. There's other things that farmers can do, uh, and biorefining is, is one area. So there's a number of drivers which are making biorefineries important, and I'm sure many of these impact on your business as well. So biorefineries aren't new. They've been around for a long time. And those that exist today tend to be what we call first-generation biorefineries. So these are biorefineries that are producing a single primary product stream. So, for example, we might have rapeseed going to biodiesel. We might have sugarcane going to bioethanol. Cornstarch going to pyolactic acid. Uh, another example that springs to mind is potato peels that are going to starch polymers that are going into packaging. We have a, a technology developed by INEOS which is looking at the gasification of biomass and what could be any organic waste to a syngas which then use a biological process to convert it to bioethanol. So these are technologies that exist and they exist at, as we see here, quite large scale. However, these technologies have a number of limitations. The first of all being that because they're only producing one primary product stream, they tend to produce byproducts or waste streams that have limited commercial value. So these waste streams at the moment are typically burned or they're put into low value products such as animal feed. Because we're only deriving one product, it makes it not very competitive with um, their petrochemical equivalents. Here in the petrochemical industry, we have an industry which is producing multiple products and it's utilising pretty much 100% of the feedstock going in. Another key limitation, which I'm sure you've all heard about in the news, because we're producing one <coughs> product stream with the existing biorefineries, we need a biomass feedstock which is rich in that component that we're converting to a product. And at the moment, these tend to be food type crops. So it tends to be maize, tends to be corn. And this is uh, raising many concerns with regards to competition for food. So this is something that's quite big at, at the moment. First generation biorefineries, typically one of the major drivers at the moment is legislation. I'm sure you've heard, all heard about the biofuel directive and the fact that many uh, or the, the fuel industry now has certain targets that it needs to meet. Typically about 20% of the, the fuel needs to be bioderived. And this is something that's really driving the industry. It's legislation that's making it happen. But in the long term, for biorefineries to be um, or to have a future, they need to stand on their own two feet. They need to be competitive and they need to address this concern with regards to the feedstocks that they're using. They, they need to be utilising biomass that isn't in competition with food. And this is really driving the development of second generation biorefineries. What we mean by that is multiple product streams derived from sustainable biomass feedstocks. So it's paralleling what the petrochemical industry is doing in terms of multiple products. One of the major areas of development is lignocellulose-based biorefineries. And lignocellulose is all of the green biomass that you see around us. It's the structural components of plants. It's wood. It's all these things that aren't in competition with food. Brewer's spent grain is another example of a, a uh, lignocellulose-based uh, biomass. But you can apply these principles to other sources of biomass, such as, say, wastewater treatment sludge. <coughs> So I'm not going to go into too many details, but this is essentially what lignocellulose is. It's a composite structure that's formed from these different components. And we can see here the different components have varying levels of complexity, from simple cellulose that's formed from C6 sugars, through to hemicellulose, which is a bit more complicated, C6 and C5 sugars, to lignin, which is a macromacular, amorphous, complex structure, um, formed from a number of different subunits. The objective of second generation biorefining is to break down these structures, refine them, <coughs> and then transform them to product streams. So, for example, we take the cellulose, we recover the C6 sugars, and we convert them to things like fuels, platform chemicals, or polymers. Hemicellulose, similar sort of fuels, 
chemicals and polymers, but also here we can recover interesting compounds like oligomers, which can be used as functional food ingredients that can be used in medicinal and pharmaceutical applications. Lignin, very interesting uh, material for us to be using. It's actually one of nature's only natural sources of aromatic compounds or major sources of aromatic compounds. But also we can use macromolecular lignin to form functional additives or to produce bioresins. Uh, and a, an area you're perhaps more familiar with, what we call direct extractives, these are things like essential oils. So these are things that we can recover and have many interesting properties for, for different applications. And the key advantages of second generation biorefining, well first of all we're utilising all of the biomass components. So this is enabling us to get the highest value return from our, our feedstock in the same way as the oil industry is getting the highest value return. So by way of comparison, this is based on dry mass, it's some estimate figures. First generation biorefining is about 700 euros per dry mass tonne. Second generation biorefining, we're looking at 1,500 per dry mass tonne. Another advantage is that we're integrating a number of different processes into one system. This means that we can offset process costs and means that we can make the processes more competitive and essentially in line with the petrochemical equivalents. <clears throat> because we're using each of the different <coughs> biomass components, we're no longer reliant on a single component in the biomass as with the first generation biorefineries. So this means that we can use more sustainable feedstocks. So we can start looking at things like industrial wastes. And because we're getting a higher value return, and because we can target multiple different product streams, it enables us to uh, achieve viability at smaller scale. And this enables us to look at flexible configuration, so we can look at products for niche markets. And it means that we can capitalise on, I've put down here, regional diversity in terms of the, maybe the crops from different areas of Europe, but similarly, we could be applying this within an industrial environment for a specific waste stream. So again, going back to our example, here we have the brewing industry. They produce a high volume of brewer spent grain waste. Things we could be doing here are, for example, converting the cellulose to PLA biopolymer. We could be using this to manufacture the bottles. We could be recovering the lignin as adhesives to stick the labels on the bottles. We could be re recovering the lignin as additives, antioxidants, which we could be putting into the polymers or perhaps even into the product. The hemicellulose, this provides functional food ingredients. I don't know whether this could go into the beer, but it's something we could certainly sell into the food industry. Hemicellulose also produces polymers with very high barrier properties, so again we can use it in the manufacture of the bottles. <coughs> So this is just an example of how we could be applying second generation biorefining in an industrial environment. However, there's a number of key challenges that are stopping this at the moment. And this is something where a lot of research focus is at the moment. I'm not going to go into too much detail, I'll put some information on the slide, but essentially one of the biggest challenges is initially breaking up that biomass into its components so that we can do something useful with each of those components. The existing processes are quite aggressive and typically you might be able to recover one component like the cellulose but that's at the detriment of the other biomass components. Also second generation biorefining it's relatively new in comparison to the first generation which is typically using C6 sugars or the, the, the starch or the cellulose components so a lot more work needs to go into how we can valorize the hemicellulose components and how we can valorize lignin. Lignin is particularly difficult because it has a very regular structure and it's actually very reactive, which means that as we break it down, it changes, which makes it difficult to use. Other challenges are more in the value chain of biorefining. First of all, it's not that well understood, so we don't quite know the right products to target, we don't quite know the right technologies to integrate together, and we haven't yet really scaled up and demonstrated the technology at large scale. So again, this is something to focus on. And there's also a, an issue in terms of end user understanding of biorefining. We all know the petrochemical industry. It's simple, reduced platform chemicals. There's established processes for utilizing, utilizing them. 
and the end users understand the chemistry. We understand the chemicals we get from the petrochemical side of industry. However, by refining, we're typically working with more complex, multifunctional and oxidised platform chemicals. Huge opportunity there, but it's not that well understood. The processes we have are emerging, they're not optimised yet, it's something we still need to put work into, and there's limited end user understanding on how to valorise or how to utilise the products we're getting out. So these are some of the key challenges that we face at the moment. In terms of the opportunity, well, it's predicted by 2020, we're looking here over $150 billion market. There's opportunities across the value chain, from the biomass supply, to the technology for the integrated biorefining, through to adoption of the technology, maybe for valorization of your wastes, or for operation of a, of a facility uh, utilizing crops, through to use of the products that we're getting out of the biorefineries. These are really quite different chemicals, they're different products, and we can use them in different ways. So what I'd like to do now is go through a few case studies of the work that PEER is doing. So we've already spoken this morning about microwave technology. Well, this is an application of the microwave plasma for the treatment of biomass. This is looking at a first-generation technology. So our objective was to improve the efficiency within which we're recovering just one of those feedstocks, in this case the uh, C6 sugars, so that we can improve the viability of the process. So here we were looking at a high sugar yields in a quicker time with reduced energy. And this resulted in a prototype <coughs> demonstrator. At the moment, that particular consortium are looking at how they can then take the next stage and integrate this into value chains. An evolution beyond that, a project we have called Biosonic, is looking towards solving some of these problems of the second generation biorefining. So here we're looking at applying ultrasonic technology to help disrupt the biomass in a more gentle way, which enables us to recover those three fractions, the cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin, um, with minimal degradation to each fraction. Again, this is looking at producing a prototype demonstrator. One of the objectives of this project will be to take this demonstrator to different industries and different industrial facilities and to show how it can be applied to break down those materials. This is an enabling technology. It'll enable um, the consortium partners to start looking at how they can then valorise each one of those fractions. Another case study that you'll see in your, your tour around PERA today, I've included it because it's a little different from the other technologies. It's a project called Aquacell. <coughs> and this is a project where we're applying um, what's called microbial fuel cells. So this is a, a typical fuel cell con um, configuration where we're actually breaking down biomass or organic waste as opposed to hydrogen to produce energy. And it's using microorganisms to do that breakdown. So the outputs of this process are electricity, um, or alternatively we can use that electricity to produce hydrogen or maybe even ammonia. So key benefits of this technology is that we're, ex we're extracting value from our waste stream. So we, at the moment, wastewater is deemed as a cost. We produce a sludge, and that sludge is expensive to get rid of. This helps us to valorise that particular waste stream. Again, we resulted in a prototype demonstrator, uh, and I believe that prototype demonstrator is down on the shop floor. Okay, so what I'd like to do is conclude with a few few visions of the future really, a few areas where I see the future of biorefining going. The first of all, I think companies are going to adopt biorefineries to valorise their waste. And I think this is potentially going to be a key first step. At the moment, they're not really competing with petrochemical industry. However, waste is a cost to many companies. So any technology we can apply to recover value from that waste or that cost is going to be of benefit. And I can see this company is either doing it directly or maybe via some kind of centralised facility. <coughs> so it might be we see companies forming which take waste from a number of companies and then start to valorise them into products. I think second and third generation technologies will be key. And here when we talk about third generation technologies, we talk about multiple waste streams going to multiple products. 
And I think they're key because they, these are the technologies that will enable commercial viability. It'll enable us to be competitive with the petrochemical sector. I think biofuels will be a key driver. There's legislation in this area, and I think many of the biorefineries we will see will be what we call biofuel-based refineries. So one of their core products, or the volume product coming out of biorefineries, will be a biofuel of some kind. And then there'll be other product streams, which are maybe the high-value products. But I also see that biorefineries will have impacts where they're able to produce products which can't be produced with petrochemical or can't be produced as cost-effectively with petrochemical feedstocks. And I think that biorefineries are going to be a key driver for competitiveness and differentiation. It's a new suite of platform chemicals we can have. It's a new suite of materials. It enables us to do new things. Another example is um, shell food waste. We can turn shell food waste into a polymer called chitosan, and that polymer actually has antimicrobial properties. So this is where we're seeing that the bio-derived materials have value beyond their petrochemical equivalents. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. If there's uh, any questions. How small is small scale? You said the second generation uh, um, are kind of more viable on a smaller scale. Can you give us an idea of how, how small that might be? Um, it, it's difficult to say, and it very much depends on what products you're taking out. If you're taking out very high-value products, then you can achieve viability on much smaller scale. Um, yeah, so it, it, it does really depend. Um, an example might be with, with, aqu with that Aquacell project where we're looking at a, a fuel cell configuration that's producing energy or hydrogen. That would be viable at a single... Um, um, say brewing facility as, as a treatment process. Just to comment on the um, the cost effectiveness of the whole, the whole process, a lot of the areas which biomass is producing, I'm thinking here of forest waste, some of the big forests that we've got in the north of England, um, the cost of trans transporting the waste material to a centralised plant is probably pretty present. Um, do you think that these small scales could be yeah, we, we've looked at projects where we've been looking at mobile facilities. So you have a lorry that drives around smaller facilities. But I think, yeah, that, that is a, a major issue in terms of logistics, transporting biomass, particularly when you have biomass that has quite a high moisture content. Um, I certainly think initially these, these facilities are going to be established in larger industries. Um, and I think from there they're going to progress. Can I ask to what extent, I mean, you did say that end user knowledge yep. or preparedness to take up the challenge of biorefining products is limited. Yeah. Is there anything happening in that area? The, the, um, th there is. The, we're aware of European initiatives to, to try and raise awareness. Um, I wouldn't say its end user knowledge is limited in every area. For, for example, biopolymers, people um, tend to have quite a strong understanding of. It tends to be more the bio-derived chemicals, which are, uh, in most instances, quite different from the petrochemical, petrochemical equivalent. And because you need different technologies to proce process them as well, it, it's almost like it's, it's a different suite of platform chemicals for the, the industry to use. Um, but yeah, there, there are some initiatives in, um, in that area. Um, for example, there's European technology platforms in this area, which is trying to educate and drive industry forward. Yeah. There, there is actually, at the end, I've put up a few papers here, which are um, provide a very basic understanding of biorefining, but a number of these are actually, <laughs> reminded me of the last slide, some of the initiatives to try and educate and, and um, and disseminate that information.